Hi, everyone. This is uh, the International Relations and Policy Clusters Monthly Roundtable. And we uh, are the members of Nickel and Dime, which is the official research and publishing platform of the Center for New, New Economic Studies. Um, for today, I, Ishani Sharma, am the moderator for the roundtable, and we have a number of panelists who have joined us. We have Malika Sondi, we have Malik Moin Abbas, we have Ryan Bhaka, we have Swapnil Khos, and we have Raghav Chavla. So uh, the topic for today's roundtable is something that has been in the news for a long time, but just because of some recent events that happened, it has started to gain even more traction. And we're going to be discussing the treatment of Uyghur Muslims in China. Uh, so to begin, I would just I would just put this question up on the floor and uh, what has been happening in the Xinjiang Autonomous Region uh, in China with respect to the Uyghur Muslim community? And I would just want someone to give a brief introduction about what kind of treatment the community is being subjected to and what is the rationale behind the Chinese government for doing that? Yeah, Ryan, please go ahead. Yeah, so um, since uh, 2017, the Chinese government has been rapidly detaining uh, more than a million uh, Uyghur Muslims in uh, re-education uh, re camps. Arbitrary detentions are being carried out uh, in the entire Xinjiang province. There have been uh, detention camps have been placed where forced conversions and in the name of re-education are being carried out. The entire culture of uh, Uyghur Muslims is being erased as part of the Chinese government's policies against a movement they, call, they uh, term as a uh, terrorist movement, which is known as the East Turkestan movement. It is an ethnically Turkic movement which aims at, uh, at a Turkic state called Turkestan being formed out of the Xinjiang province. Which uh, which which is critically uh, important, which which is a province which is critically important for China. Most of the cotton comes out of there, and uh, uh, for 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 these multinational brands that we call H and M and Zara, most of that cotton, the 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 largest amount of cotton in the world comes out of Xinjiang. It shares a border with the Central Asian republics of Kyrgyzstan, and Tajikistan and Kazakhstan, as well as as well as with uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan which is an important corridor as far as uh, the Belt and Road Initiative goes. It uh, links, it, it formed, uh, that was the first area that formed links through the One Belt, One Road Initiative back in 2014. So through these reasons, China, is, uh, China wants to undermine this movement and it's using its special surveillance technologies and its mass PLA force to undermine this movement. Oh, thank you, Raymond. Yeah, Malika. Yeah, so the Uyghur Muslim population is the second largest minority, ethnic minority in China. And with Xinjiang being the largest province in China, at having so many mineral resources, and like Raymond said also, is the is the fifth largest producer of cotton in the world. Just that one region produces one fifth of the cotton in the world. And is such an important thing, it's such an important region, such an important political move for China. Like this entire region has seen is so, is so important to the economy of the country that the population of the Yuga Muslim, which is 12 million, has rapidly seen a decrease in the region because of the uh, immigration of Han Chinese, which is the largest ethnic minority in China, moving in to set up economic practices. So the violations that have been carried out by women said are extreme in the sense that uh, detonation camps and even sterilization for the women of the Yuga Muslim population. So these all, like these all allegations, like that's what China calls them. They say these are allegations, these are false. Like China has denied them on every front. And this, because the, the, this region is so important, it's like, the, so exactly what happened in Tibet that we saw, the region had also taken up like independence, that fought an independence movement and had gained independence in the early 19th, 20th century. But then again, by 1949, China came and took over. So China's fighting hard to keep this region. And the international community is like started like you know picked up on this, and obviously these violations are something that is was really widely broadcast from 2018 to 2020. 
Uh, thank you, Malika. Both of you all have given a very comprehensive overview of the whole situation. Uh, so taking into consideration how both of you all said there have been some great human, uh, grave human rights violations committed by the Chinese government and also keeping in mind how human rights is something that every human gets just because they are humans and not because they are say a citizen of a particular state or something. So considering that in mind, I feel it's the international community that should come forward to the aid of this community irrespective of whether they're citizens of China or whether China claims this to be an internal matter. Um, having said that, how has the international community responded to these human rights violations in Xinjiang by the Chinese government? And as a follow-up to this, uh, why, why is it that the U United Nations uh, has been unable to take any stern action against the Chinese? Yeah, Malika and then Ryan. So we... Sorry. Yeah, so we've seen like the US, UK, Netherlands, all of them have like sternly, sternly put up sanctions against China for what is exactly happening in the region of Xinjiang. And even like companies like Diamond said, H&M, Zara, they have also put up statements stating that they are going to, they're going to stop using the wool, like the, the cotton that's coming from the region because in protest to the, these violations. The parliament of the British parliament has also put up sanctions and has also put up stated in parliament that they are abhorrently against the practices that China is doing. Even Australia has put up policies. So these all sanctions, while being in place, this is the region is these violations are still taking place. Like we're still hearing and we're still seeing these violations take place. So the exact impact of which is something that is still debatable. Uh, Swapna. Um, right. So I'd like to address the follow-up which you raised, which is talking about the UN stance on this matter. So, um, when we talk of the UN taking action on any international matter, what we usually refer to are sanctions, right? Um, sanctions or even the deployment of peacekeeping forces, but that comes much later. What do we think of in the first instance? Now, sanctions can only be imposed by the UN Security Council, of which China is a permanent member. So obviously, any move by, um, let's say, USA to impose sanctions on China, to sanction them for uh, whatever is happening in Xinjiang will be immediately shot down. Like the Security Council cannot even pass a remotely critical resolution on this matter. Then moving on to other UN bodies. Um, a very relevant body in this matter is, of course, the Human Rights Council, which in this uh, August of this year, 31st August, they did issue a report um, saying that what China is doing in Xinjiang essentially may amount to international crimes, including crimes against humanity, which is a landmark uh, report on this matter, right? It's the first official statement that a UN body has made that what's happening in Xinjiang is um, wrong, constitutes violations of international law. But uh, the UN Human Rights Council as a body can't really go much beyond this. They can't impose sanctions on them. Um, and even this report, the issuing of this very report is something which is very contested. Right? Um, there, there are Associated Press reports out there which say that many diplomats believe that this report was complete almost a year ago. But China was simply delaying the publishing of this report uh, because obviously it was very critical. In fact, the UN uh, Commissioner for Human Rights, Michelle Bachelet, this report was issued on the last day of her tenure, and then she left because she didn't want to deal with the backlash which would come from China and which has come from China. They have issued their own 120 page counter report. And um, another body which some people tried to appeal to in this issue was the International Criminal Court. When in 2020, a case was raised on the matter of the human rights violations in India. But this was dismissed because Xinjiang is part of China. The victims are Chinese citizens and even the perpetrators are Chinese. And since China isn't party to the Rome Statute, which is the foundational document of the ICC, um, the ICC can't intervene in this. Now, it should be noted that not being party to the Rome Statute isn't unique to China. USA, for example, also isn't party to the Rome Statute. But it's just another way in which international bodies can't really intervene in the Xinjiang process. Uh Thank you, Swapnil. Um, you mentioned the Human Rights Council, and I think it was just recently that the motion was 
introduced to discuss the whole situation and that was also rejected and again that's not the unsc there china does not have a veto so that brings me to my next question how much of a role do you think geopolitics or say the larger international power dynamics they play in allowing china to get away with committing such crimes and um for example hypothetically had it been india or some other emerging power in the same situation do you believe the international response the sort of the lack of the international response would have been the same yeah uh, rayamond and then stop yeah so essentially china has played its geopolitical cards very well out here through uh, uh, so uh, one for one thing being a turkic my uh, turkic community the uyghurs you would expect that they would fall well into the central asian strategies of say turkey or uh, many other uh, turkic countries which would come out and support them however many other muslim countries mainly the muslim world has uh, as 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 you mentioned the motion to discuss uh, the uh, discuss the uyghur issue at the at the un was uh, being abstained either abstained or being voted against by these muslim countries which was which was quite uncharacteristic of their uh, their ideological propensities but uh, here uh, here the, the the dependency that china creates the economic dependency the technological dependency through various initiatives such as the bri so there's a lot of chinese cash there's a lot of chinese equipment coming into say turkey the uae uh, saudi arabia many such countries they're relying on china for this and a cornerstone of how china trades is by establishing these rules by binding the binding in, uh, the markets in any country to these rules never discuss taiwan never discuss uyghurs never discuss any other pertaining issue about china as an external issue it is always an internal issue for them so this is how china actually creates a dependency and then uh, and then allows other nations to adhere to its policy this is how many latin american nations have in recent days withdrawn their uh, withdrawn their recognition of taiwan so i think this uh, this uh, this factor has a big part to play when we consider uh, geopolitics as an imperative for chinese strategies uh, against the uyghurs that's a really interesting point raiman thank you uh, yeah swapna please go ahead um right so um raiman has really hit the crux of the matter which is chinese economic leverage over um out of countries in the developing world which is prevented or which is stopping them from really taking a firm stance on this matter like even if we were to see the countries that have really come out and criticized china in this matter for example countries which um through various legislative measures have recognized what's happening in xinjiang is genocide it's canada it's uh, uk it's france it's japan which is uh, not a western country but it's still a regional geopolitical rival of china and addressing the second part of a question of um what would happen if this was some other emerging power um historically we can see that western nations and when i say western nations i mean primarily the usa which determines the policy of a lot of europe in general europe tends to do what western europe tends to do what usa does you the usa isn't very averse to backing autocratic states in the third world as long as it benefits their own geopolitical interests uh, for the longest time they have been backing saudi arabia which um doesn't exactly have a stellar human rights record they supported a lot of repressive dictatorships in latin america during the cold war um but when what does happen when the hammer of the usa does come down is when a country is like opposite to its geopolitical interests right this is what it's what we seeing with iran it's what we've seen with cuba with venezuela like sure these countries have appalling human rights records but the reason the usa is sanctioning them is because of not because of any you know ethical concerns but because of geopolitical reasons right iran is opposing us interests in the middle east and as well as with the same in latin america and so on. um specifically in the if it was some other emerging country like used example of india um you know india again has had its own issues with our human rights record right? like let's say if you look at what's happening in kashmir and we haven't attracted a significant level of international criticism 
on this regard. So I think when countries reach a certain level of economic prominence, it becomes difficult to really sanction them in any way. Like this is the reason why US isn't sanctioning China, right? It's because their economies are so intrinsically tied to each other that um, any sanctions on the Chinese economy are going to have repercussions on the American economy as well, negative repercussions. And particularly with what's happening in Russia, due to the sanctions on Russia, how global economic order is already very strained. I think that's further preventing the U.S. from taking any really harsh economic actions. Uh, but essentially, uh, to answer your question of what if it was any other emerging country, I, I don't think China fits the classification of an emerging country anymore, even really a superpower. But if it was an emerging country, it very much depends on whether that country is supporting U.S.'s foreign policy. Uh, thank you, Swapnil. Uh, Building on from what you just said about how it is unlikely that the US will sanction China because given its economic leverage and also how strained the world economy is right now after the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Uh, I would just want to ask that given that the UN has sort of been inefficient or has sort of lagged the power to actually take any uh, efficient or any stone action against china is there again like a possibility of a collective action against china by the countries themselves um malika mentioned that there have been sanctions but again those sanctions have been against some chinese officials and not china as a country as as a whole so do you think there's a possibility of a collective multi multilateral action against china uh, can you hear me yeah, yeah, Malik, please go ahead. And oh, no, not too much noise. I'm just shuffling around to sit somewhere where it's not too noisy. Um, I completely agree with Swapnil. Uh, multilateral forums, sanctions, United Nations. Well, well, the United Nations and Stern, these two words haven't gone together for a long time now. Just little denouncements and that's about it. The reason is China is embedded there. It has leverage, as was earlier pointed out. So I don't see a lot of hope from uh, states and therefore multilateral forums where only states are represented to have any great effect. I mean, uh, European Union introduced the human rights sanction regime, but that and blacklisted like three officials, sanctioned them, their travel and stuff. But beyond that, nothing substantial. I have more hope from businesses, uh, transnational businesses, uh, because recently although Turkey repaired its relations with China, it muted its criticism on the Uyghur issue. But there are many businesses in Turkey who are uh, starting a campaign of uh, disinvesting from China, getting away from China, or at least blocking the supply chain, which starts from the Uyghur region, starts from those cotton plantations, uh, or the production which happens because of the forced labor there. So hitting that exactly, and you can see this initiative in Turkey. You can see it in many of the Turkic states of Central Asia, like recently Kyrgyzstan, and some areas of uh, some businesses in Kazakhstan uh, started this initiative, although China is also gaining deep leverage there, but with the states, not with the businesses as much. They have greater autonomy of how to operate, where to operate. So yes, I see greater hope in like people, businesses, even corporations, transnational businesses, uh, not so much from the states, uh, even any other multilateral forum besides EU once on limited occasions. Uh, I don't see a lot of hope there. Diamond, yeah, please. Um, for uh, multilateral sanctions, uh, so clearly there's some commitment, but for them to succeed, uh, it is very important for us to understand uh, China's escalatory behavior, as the Philippines has understood. So it is, it is, it's, it's just not that uh, many countries are dependent economically on China. China is also economically very much dependent on the world. So by escalating to a certain extent. And then uh, uh, to a certain extent that the Chinese cannot match is, I think, a very good strategy to go forward. So uh, selecting certain avenues where you can uh, successfully impede Chinese uh, growth. Remember, right now, even right now, Chinese growth is falling. So if, if, certain, if certain areas are focused upon and uh, escalation is carried out in a very, uh, in a very ordered fashion, 
then I think the Chinese government has, in in certain instances, shown evidences of withdrawing, and of conceding efforts. So now, uh, again, Chinese diplomacy is at a point where you have uh, where where you have an aggressive show of nationalism, where you have an aggressive coercive ability in them. So in order to make sanctions successful, it is important to match that coercion. It is important to debunk them in that way. Uh, thank you, Raymond. Yes, Raja. So what I think is that uh, when you have deep pockets like China and when you're a P5 member, uh, the international community response is very limited. But where the international community can make a pressure is uh, exactly. I agree with Malik that the only the business community can make a big response. Uh, for example, so in China's um, in region, um, a lot of surveillance systems have been set up to monitor citizens. And a lot of these systems run with softwares run by American companies like HP and Intel. So you, the US can effectively use those companies to block these uh, fa facial recognition systems and the surveillance systems. And second, uh, the Uyghur uh, labor is a very cheap labor which is being used in these countries. So uh, effectively banning these labors is a very good method. And if you look at uh, um, the ongoing Beijing 22 Olympics, it's a very good, it's a very good, uh, if the company, if the countries can play the cards right, it's a very big event to create pressure on China. Because obviously these um, events happen to actually bolster the um, image of the country. So if some, if a country can play the cards right, they can obviously hurt China where they want to. Uh, uh, so thank you, Raghu. Yeah. So I think sort of most of you all have already answered my next question, but if anyone would want to just sort of give a concluding statement as to what could be the way forward for the Uyghur Muslim community in China and what can be done to improve their situation. Yeah, Malika, please. Right now, what we have seen is that the Uyghur Muslim population is not able to fight back because of the immense like military action that China has taken in the region, not only the military, like administration action. If you see the documentaries that have been shot in the region, they can see that they're, they're under like heavy surveillance, like everybody's already said. And I think it's just exactly what Raymond said, that you have to have, like, unless action is taken by the global community, not just the public, but not just like, the private sphere and the public sphere, like, the unless the action taken is that immense, that China will be forced to back off and be forced to listen, like, that is the only way out of the situation. That's the only way to get them to sort of adhere to norms and to international, like, to adhere to, like, to maintain international, like, the rights of people and of the, uh, the population there. Uh, thank you, Malika. So we've had a very fruitful discussion today. We've talked about, we started with a very deep introduction of the issue, and then we delve deeper into why is it that the international community has not really uh, responded that strongly to China. And again, the reason has to be power politics, as uh, someone mentioned how the US only would only um, play a role when its own interests are at stake. And also, of course, there's the economic leverage of China. Then we moved on to solutions and how if multilateral action or if state-led action is not likely, maybe the businesses can come forward and they can take, uh, they can do something about it. Um, so I just want to thank everyone for all their inputs. It was a great discussion. And, and we'll see you for our next episode. Thank you.